Now we will also have another interesting topic that also revolves around the individual. And I actually wanted to start by addressing a question to all of you. Can I see a show of hands who's driving an electric vehicle here? Quite a few, but still I think that we would need more. So as you might have well guessed, our next panel is going to address electric vehicles, infrastructure and regulations across MENA. It is said that a wide integration of electric vehicles in the transportation systems could potentially lead to a higher speed of adopting renewable electricity sources. Within the UAE, under the Smart Dubai initiative, there were over 200 electric vehicle charging stations installed, as well as by 2030, it is estimated that 25% of the transportation is going to be smart and driverless. Across the border, I think that we've all heard the news that uh, the public investment fund in Saudi Arabia acquired 5% of Tesla, so probably we all wonder what's the direction that we are heading into. Let's hear more about this, uh, as well as challenges and best opportunities, over a discussion led by Rida Sabuni, the Managing Director in the MENA region for the Clean Energy Consultancy Energetics. Rida has been for over a decade leading the development of a variety of clean energy technologies, programs and best practices. And prior to coming to the region, he was providing strategic consulting support to the US Department of Energy, US National Laboratories and government clients. Please join us on the stage, Rida. And let's give him a big round. Alongside him, let me also invite our panelists, Samer Alawi, the CEO of FutureLink and Green Parking. <laughs> Stefan Gobert, Senior Strategy Manager at NG Mescat. <laughs> Steve Severance, leading the program management and marketing for Mazder City. And lastly, Mark Carson, Director of Customer Experience and Quality for Reno Mina. Thank you very much, and over to you, Rida. Okay, all right. Thank you very much for the introduction uh, to the topic and uh, welcome all for being here. So you took my first question actually. That was going to be my first question is how many people have, have an electric vehicle? I wanted to ask a couple of follow-up questions as well to that. Um, so who has driven an electric vehicle? Okay, so some test drivers, okay. Who is thinking of purchasing an electric vehicle as your next purchase, your next car purchase? Okay, that's actually pretty impressive. Okay, very good. All right, so um, in terms of the structure of, of how we will do this discussion for the next 30 to 40 minutes, uh, I will start with some brief introductory comments to, to lay some context to the topic. Uh, I'll ask each of our esteemed panelists, uh, we have a nice, really nice uh, 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 set of uh, folks here, to introduce themselves, and then we will go into the topic, basically breaking it up into uh, where are we now, uh, so where are we right now in terms of electric vehicles, infrastructure? And then where do we want to be and what is it, what will it take to get there? And then we'll also talk about enabling technologies and enabling business practices that could allow us to get there. Um, so that'll be the structure for, for today. Uh, so before we have the panelists introduce themselves, I want to mention a few brief comments. Uh, so Dr. Nasser in the morning mentioned some, some key data points, right? So one in 250 cars in the world today is an electric vehicle. So that's 0.4% if you do the math. Um, so I think we actually have more people than, than uh, represented around the world in this room, electric vehicle owners. Um, but why is it an important topic? It's an important topic because we expect a great growth in this, in this area. So by 2040, we expect 548 million uh, uh, EV stock, uh, which will be 32% of passenger vehicles. Okay? So there will be a huge business opportunity uh, from now over the next 10, 15, 20 years in this topic. Um, and the last data point I'll give you, a little nugget of information which I thought was interesting, it's a recent report by uh, BNB, BNP Paribas, which is the eighth largest bank in the world. Um, they've released a report in August called Wells, Wires, and Wheels, Energy Return on Capital Invested. So basically they, they took the perspective of an oil company 
If you're an oil company, you have $100 billion to invest. Does it make more sense for you to invest in new oil production, exploration, or does it make more sense for you to invest in electric vehicles and renewable energy infrastructure? So those two things in tandem. And they found that basically uh, EVs with renewable energy gives you a six to seven times more useful energy than if you were to, to actually go and try to explore and, and, and produce oil over a 25 year period. So in their words, they said, we conclude that the economics of oil for gasoline and diesel vehicles versus wind and solar powered EVs are now relentless and irreversible decline. So the, the, the outlook in the future is very much favored towards electric vehicles. Right now, not many electric vehicles, and that's why we have this panel to basically try to understand where we are now and how we could get to that future. So with that, I want to maybe go through uh, 30 seconds to one minute if you could introduce yourself and your company. And uh, we'll start maybe Steve at the end and we'll go uh, this way. Uh, sure, so I always like to, Steve Severn from Mazdar City, and I always like to ask one more question. How many of you have been to Mazdar City? Uh, quite a few hands, excellent. Uh, because for those of you who have not driven an electric vehicle, we have the world's first, and especially if you haven't driven a Tesla, all due respect to the fine vehicles put out by Renault and uh, Chevrolet, only three manufacturers are selling in the region right now, but the Tesla is the most fun to drive. We have the world's first car sharing, so come out there, download the app, take it out for a minute or an hour, uh, and see uh, how enjoyable driving an electric vehicle can be. Uh, hi, thanks Rida for the introduction. I'm Stefan from uh, NG, uh, international utility company. Um, focusing on uh, more and more renewable energy, so to, to answer uh, your findings that you can read in the BNP Paribas uh, documents, actually uh, a thought that we gave ourselves as a b large utility companies, uh, we started our decarbonization as well, moving away from coal and moving away uh, more and more from uh, fossil fuel, uh, because it's a, it's a conclusion that we have drawn uh, that there is uh, more interest for us and for the environment, of course, to, to bet on uh, renewable energies. So I'm uh, heading the strategy for the Middle East and uh, Central Asia. And also, I'm uh, glad to share with you that uh, we, we have uh, within the CBC uh, a working group called the Future Mobility Club. And I'm uh, co-heading this uh, uh, think tank, uh, very interesting with uh, some of the members here, uh, some on my, on my right hand side. And I, uh, I would like to engage you with this, uh, this group and uh, you can find more information within ourselves, but uh, we're trying to bring more awareness downstream uh, regarding future mobility, not only electric vehicles as we are going to talk today, but also uh, future fuels. Uh, downstream to the users like you who are going to change uh, because there's no doubt about this uh, there will be a change uh, if you're thinking about buying a car it's probably uh, the last time you're going to buy a, a, an, an internal combustion engine uh, car uh, but also trying to build bridge with the governments uh, bring awareness share experience on what has been done in other cities um, and see how we can uh, create uh, new markets and uh, new interests uh, towards the environment. Thank you. Sam. My name is Sam Alawi. I'm the managing partner of uh, Green Parking. Uh, next year we uh, are happy to celebrate our 25th uh, birthday locally, which uh, will coincide with uh, Dubai 2020. So uh, uh, when we started nearly 25 years ago, we were a parking company, uh, a parking equipment supply company. A couple of years later, we had to change our business model to become a one-stop shop and uh, mainly a parking operations company. And uh, throughout these 24 years, uh, the name Green Parking says it. It's our trademark and means that any system or service we provide must have an environmental benefit compared to competing systems. So this is what we stand for, and this is why we entered the EV uh, infrastructure business, uh, the charger business, uh, around eight years ago in Dubai, uh, because we wanted to have our car parks equipped with a facility to charge electric vehicles at a time where nobody was uh, thinking about electric vehicles uh, in the region, because we are, uh, of course, a petrol um, uh, state company. But 
we knew that at some stage it will come. And when uh, uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed took the initiative to make uh, Dubai and the UAE uh, leading in uh, green economy, DIWA was, uh, was then ready to issue the first tenders for electric vehicle networks. And uh, at that time, we were then ready with our team to work together with DIWA to provide the first uh, electric uh, vehicle uh, charging networks in the UAE. And uh, by now, we have uh, basically two lines of business. The first one is uh, selling chargers and uh, software uh, for the EV network. And the second one is building uh, EV network ourselves, which we started with two years ago. Uh, and um, uh, we can say that um, excluding the Tesla chargers, we have around 80% uh, market share uh, in the UAE and uh, Oman by now. Excellent. Thank you. Mark. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Carson. I'm the Customer Experience and Quality Director for Renault Middle East. Um, we obviously were the first uh, uh, mo manufacturer to bring electric cars in the region, which starts back in 2012 when we first entered with the Twizy. Um, for those of you that know outside of the Middle East, uh, the Zoe is probably, which is our small electric car, is the market leader in Europe for sales. Um, and we've de uh, developed a range of vehicles, not just the uh, LCV as well. Uh, Renault is not just about electric cars. We're looking about, obviously, uh, renewables, uh, recyclables. It's more about the ecosystem. So we're looking at what we can also do with the vehicle to you for you in Europe to take electricity from the vehicle to power your 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 uh, residence. So electric infrastructure is a lot more than just the vehicle. Um, and as you will see over the coming probably five years, the automotive industry is going through a, a big revolution at the moment with connected cars and various other different things. So we see even with the customer, the customer experience and the customer purchase will change. Um, and we talked earlier about, you said, how many people are thinking. We're probably looking at people will more lease, more tech companies will be coming involved in leasing. So we see a big change, but it will be driven by electrification for sure. Okay. So let's start with just the current status. Um, so where are we now? If, if Samir, maybe you could start us out. You have this 80% market share. Um, how are we maybe talk in terms of Dubai, talk in terms of UAE, and if you could expand it out to Oman, even across the region, whatever knowledge, and I want to encourage the panelists to, to jump in as needed. Um, let's give everyone a lay of the land across the MENA region as much as we can. First of all, Hello? Yeah. First of all, I'm happy to say that uh, the UAE has uh, by now achieved one of the best ratios in the world between the number of chargers being installed and the number of cars. So that by itself is you know, one of the three best companies in the world in this kind of ratio. Um, so we have around, uh, I would say, 600 chargers now in Dubai. Uh, but the problem is that the, uh, the, this number of chargers uh, available is unevenly distributed. So we have more than 80% of the network available in Dubai, mainly driven by Diwa, and uh, the other 20% are in the neighboring Emirates. So um, as we are a very small group, I just want to give you, uh, uh, a, you know, a, a small story that happened to me two, two weeks ago. So first of all, I'm uh, very glad and proud that my son, he is uh, 15 years old, is uh, join, joining this panel discussion because everything we're doing here is actually not going to affect us very much, it's actually for the future generations. Yeah? And uh, two weeks ago, I, uh, I wanted to spend a weekend with him in a, in a hotel, in a five-star hotel in Abu Dhabi. So we took our i3, which is a standard um, electric vehicle car, has a range of around 200 kilometers, and we said, let's, let's drive over to Abu Dhabi to play some tennis and spend a weekend there. So we drove to this five-star hotel, nearly had 30 kilometers left on the battery when we arrived, and then found out that this five-star hotel doesn't have electric vehicle charger. Mm. Okay, 
it was good that we took our home charger with us, which, you know, charges five kilometers per hour. Uh, so there was a socket in the parking, you know, we could use that. And then, unfortunately, this five-star hotel, which is as big as a city, did not have a tennis court. So then we said, okay, playing tennis without a tennis court is not good. Let's drive to another hotel. And that other hotel on the same island that had a tennis court was 30 kilometers away. So we jumped in the car, we drove to that hotel, we asked, where is your charger? Again, that hotel had no charger. So we said, doesn't matter, let us allow us to go to the parking, we will take the home charger, and then we will plug it for a couple of hours, and then we're able to return. So the valley parking allowed us in, and then when we reached down, we wanted to charge, we had five security guards encircling on us and say, what are you doing here? We said, well, we want to charge the car. Oh no, if you do this, the whole electricity of the hotel would collapse. Uh, we said, no, it's just charging a buggy, which you have here. So they had to call the head of engineering. I had to download the specification of the charger, the specification of the car. Took us an hour before he made an exception so we could charge the car and just drive back after a couple of hours. This is a small example, which happens every day, if you want to drive to. Abu Dhabi, the reason for that is that uh, the hotels are afraid to uh, purchase chargers because there is no official approval yet for the installation of these kind of chargers uh, in Abu Dhabi. It will come shortly, but it gives you an indication of where we are standing with respect to the network at the moment. Uh, even within a country like the UAE with different emirates. So neighboring countries look even completely different. So there's either no legislation ready or there is no need for uh, investment, there's not enough uh, electric vehicles, etc. Uh, so this should describe where we are standing at the moment quite. So Mark, from your perspective as a manufacturer, so Dubai seems to be leading the way um, across the region. So what is your perspective on where we are and, and, and what has Dubai done right to kind of be at the leader position? Uh, from, from the, the Renault perspective? I mean, Dubai, what Dubai has done right, it's took the initiative and it started with Diva and installed 200 chargers because we've got 200 more than nothing from, from our perspective. That does start to develop growth, but it's the, the general public and the people that we need to buy, which I would say is more affordable mobility because we do need more electric vehicles on the road and we need it for affordable mobility from that point of view. So those people really don't need what Sam has just explained, which is really a range anxiety, but through the lack of an infrastructure. So you need an infrastructure in place to give the confidence for people to go out and buy. Because, I mean, I've driven an electric car here for six years now, mm. and I've never run out of battery. Maybe once or twice I've been very close, but I've never run out of battery. I've found a way, because you do change the way you drive the vehicle, etc. But as the infrastructure has grown, life has become easier. I mean, if I go back three, four years, there was no, no um, charges in the Mall of Emirates. So now you can plan around it. So it makes owning an electric vehicle a lot more easier, but we still need to do more with infrastructure because the more infrastructure we have, the more confidence that we have. Uh, and uh, as Sam has said, is that you would expect the major hotels all to have a charging facility because it's not just the small affordable, it's the Tesla, etc. So it's generating more of that confidence, I think, that we need to grow more electric vehicles. It, it's a bit like chicken and egg at this right. point in time. Right, right. So, Steve, you're over in Abu Dhabi. Um, what's your perspective in Abu Dhabi and, and anything else you want to add on this, uh, this topic of where we are right now? Uh, what I'd say is that in Mazdar, we started in 2009 with the first electric vehicles and first electric charging stations in the country. Uh, and in 2009, the vehicle that we brought out wasn't ready for the Middle East. One of the things we haven't talked about is climate and what, what happens to batteries uh, in what happens to batteries in this heat. We've come a long way since then. 
And I think there's still a perception, though, the electric vehicle is not an enjoyable driving experience, and the consumer still has, outside of Tesla, which has changed the perception. But other than that, I think there's still a, a general perception that it's not an enjoyable perform, uh, driving experience. It won't go far enough. Um, but I think that one of the things that we need to talk about, yes, there are 200 chargers. I would love to buy an electric vehicle. Absolutely love to. If I could, but I don't want to charge at the mall. I don't want to charge at the gas station. I want to charge at my apartment. I want to drive down in there and have a couple of electric parking chargers. But right now, there's no incentive for, if I have to pay for it myself and hook it up to my own meter and get NOCs from everyone and their brother, this is just more than triple the price of the car, of, of the car charger. Uh, the building owner doesn't want to put it in because only DEWA can sell power. So everything you've done for green parking, you have not done it on an investment basis. You've done it for DEWA. So Mazdaar is invested in, Mazdaar's invested in London, but on a risk sharing basis where we're actually putting in the chargers and selling, and selling power in a way that we put in renewable energy and sell renewable energy. We need a, and then there is the car pricing. And this is, uh, we'll, we'll hit Mark a little bit for this. I, I won't pick on Mark, I'm gonna pick on, I'm gonna pick on a competitor. Uh, cause I'm, also because I'm an American. I can get a Chevy, I can lease a Chevy Bolt for 500 US in America. That includes a bit of a federal tax credit, but it's 500 a month. That is 1,900 dirhams. What can you lease for 1,900 dirhams here? It's not nearly as nice as the Chevy Bolt. But if I wanna lease a Chevy Bolt here, it's over 4,000 dirhams a month. That's over $1,100 a month for a car. That's not affordable for most people. But $1,900 is affordable for most people. So we need to look at the regulations. And I would also say that we'd love to standardize between Abu Dhabi and Dubai. When we put in, we needed 20 chargers at Mazdar. So we put them in. And we worked with your company. But despite the fact that you have 80% of the DEWA market, you weren't cleared yet for ADDC. Uh, we couldn't understand it, and you couldn't understand it, but it, it's taken that long, and there is, like, unfortunately, too many things in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. There's not a path toward unification. And in, when you're driving gasoline cars and internal combustion engines, that really doesn't matter. But for the electric vehicle and the infrastructure, we need a lot more working together across the seven Emirates to put that infrastructure in. Yeah, sure, Sam. Yeah, if I may answer um, everything that you said, which was inc incredibly interesting. Well, the, f the first thing I have to say, well, we have three different product lines. One is what I explained before, is selling chargers and software, mainly to DEWA and other power um, entities. Yeah. The other one is we have uh, invested to, uh, to create our own EV network from Abu Dhabi to Oman. So these are all our charges paid by us, invested by us, and they are free of charge to anybody who wants to use them. And they will continue to be free of charge to anybody who wants to use them because in this case of the network, our cooperation partners are the hotels. And they ah, want okay. to have these kind of uh, people driving these cars to come to their facility, so we are cooperating with them. And the third product line that we have, which is actually the most successful product line we have at the moment, is the example you mentioned for the towers. So, or for the communities. So we have a lot of uh, contracts with communities at the moment that need to install one or two or three chargers for the couple of cars that they have, but they don't want to incur the overheads, the costs of managing a charging that costs nine dirhams. And through exactly. our app that we have developed for the network, we have now a solution for them. We take over the hassle of charging the car, taking the payment through the app and the credit card and paying it back to the operator and organizing who is allowed to charge for how many hours and, 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 and uh, during what time of the day. So these are the business models that derive out of experience and that is what we see is going to happen in the next couple of years. Although there is not going to be a lot of cars because the manufacturers are not willing to sell in this region, this is the biggest problem that we have at the moment. They all want to sell in Europe and they want to trade the carbon emissions because they get a lot of rewards for selling the cars in Europe now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're not gonna have a lot of cars, but for those cars that are there, every building, at least in Dubai, that's going to be uh, built in future must have, must, have, must yeah. have these facilities. So we are going to have an overkill of chargers in the next couple of years. Maybe we will have more chargers than cars. 
<laughs> the way I see it going. So I want Mark to respond to this, but I first want to give, if, if I, if I yeah. could give yeah, Stefan yeah, yeah, a chance yeah. to get into the conversation. So Stefan, from your perspective, from Angie's perspective, where are we now and, and, and what is your vision? Where do you think we could be going towards in the UAE and across the region? Well, um, many big questions uh, just got raised uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, that these are typically questions we try to convey when we, we gather to, together the Future Mobility uh, Club. Um, I, I hear awareness, uh, I hear lack of uh, B2B investments, uh, however from our perspective uh, we are a little bit like the, the DIWA back in France, so we are a large utility uh, uh, provider uh, in Europe and uh, also in this part of the world and we, we want to take part to, obviously to the green mobility, we are very interested in that, we are committed uh, to electric uh, mobility uh, in other parts of the world. And uh, I can see from, from my perspective, we are joining a little bit the previous panel on energy efficiency, where you cannot sell electricity because it's DIWA, so one of your uh, topics that you were saying, so why would you invest in this? And that's a problem we are facing because in some other place, uh, in Europe, for instance, we are managing complete network of charging station including installation, operation, maintenance, retail of electricity from our own power stations that are renewables. Perfect uh, virtuous uh, circle. And we're trying to, we would like to do this in this region, but uh, the, the chain, the power chain is very integrated. And uh, in the case of Dubai, only Diwa can sell electricity. Unless it's behind the meter, then you still pay your bill to Diwa so they don't really mind what you're doing. So when you're talking about common areas, it's the same for energy efficiency. Our owner would install solar panels on his roof for his tenants because he doesn't pay the bill. So these are big questions we, we're trying to address. Uh, and I'm glad that Sam has also started to promote some, some solutions. However, from our perspective, we see that uh, government, uh, especially in Dubai, but more and more in Abu Dhabi and in Saudi Arabia is committed and it's actually more committed than the B2B sector because they don't understand yet uh, the economic value of having a couple of charging stations in their hotels, for example, because they would attract new customers that would choose to go there instead of the hotel next door. So that's something which is already understood in, in Europe. So uh, restaurant A would have invested in two charging stations because the next door restaurant people cannot charge. Um, so there is economic value in investing in this. And second, the, uh, to bounce back on what Mark was saying, the behavior, it's a change of behavior. You, you don't go to the petrol station as we do to charge your, your car. You don't, need to, you don't need to have a lot of those uh, DUA charging station. These are more on the emergency. You charge at night at home, you charge in the office, you charge when you go to that hotel or that restaurant. So there's still a... Uh, a lack of understanding from, uh, from the users, and we're trying to, to work on this, that would drive the change so they can uh, invest in an electric vehicle that is expensive if you look at the bill today, but over time, the total cost of ownership, is, it is cheaper. As of today, it's already, it's already economically viable. Mm -hmm. So in the next two years, we'll be, there will be no other uh, choice. That will be the only rational choice for, for a buyer. So if we compare to commitment from cities, I think Dubai would, should reach to that goal if they want to be smart, if they want to have a, a certain level of happiness of the inhabitants, citizens, if they want to drive future development, uh, and they are serious envi about environment, they will uh, definitely move on to policies that are similar to what we see in Europe. We are operating in Rotterdam, for example, we have a 20 years commitment to operate 3,000 charging stations in, in the city of Rotterdam, and it's growing. It will be even more. We are uh, installing them until 2020. And uh, that is a strong message for the citizens. Uh, it is the second largest economic zone in, in the Netherlands. So it has a huge port, uh, a huge level of business. Uh, everything, everybody understands the role of electric mobility. Uh, and I'm not even talking about new models like shared drive to improve the fluidity of the traffic, but just in terms of economics, uh, it is already 
um, at a very high pace, and we can only expect that Dubai will, uh, will do something similar looking at their current commitment. Today, just to give you a number, there is uh, less than 1,000 car registered, electric car registered, mm. uh, but Dubai is a target of 40,000 cars by 2030. Mm. So it's a bit uh, back to the chicken and egg story. It's a bit difficult. Dubai and uh, Abu Dhabi or even Saudi Arabia with new cities coming up, sustainable cities, uh, they do their share. They commit to a certain percentage of the governmental vehicles. They committed to install infrastructure, but uh, B2B sector, the business sector, has also to do its part. And us as user, we need to do again our calculation, our math, and see that it's actually viable. And we can, all of us, have an impact on the environment. We don't need just to look at uh, how much it costs today, but we should look at uh, the lifetime of an electric vehicle and, and see what we can do also as user. Mm -hmm. So 40,000 vehicles by 2030. So Mark, I'm going to ask you, <laughs> but first of all, I want to remind the audience, if you have questions, you could go to, to Slido. I don't know if you want to show that slide, uh, but if you have questions, I'll be checking that and we'll be answering your questions. So, so Mark, perspective of the OEMs, how do we get to that target? That, that, if that is our vision, how do we make sure we have more models in the UAE and we're more like Europe? Uh, what, is the, what is the pathway to get there? It's a very good question, uh, and there are so many different answers that you can go through. But if I, I come back to, to one thing from, from last year, what we actually did last year was we actually put on a leasing program for electric vehicle for 1,999 dirhams. <laughs> and in three months, we had one person take up. So and it was a loss leader to us. We did it for a loss. We knew we'd make a loss on it for what we were looking at, but it was try to drive some awareness and see what participation that we could get. So that's one of the first challenges because I think we could sell, we can all sell to fleet, but the general user, we need, they need to be converted to go to electric car. I mean, for me, I've driven one. I don't really want to go back to an internal combustion engine. I'm, I'm quite happy. I'm, I'm converted from that point of view. But for the manufacturers, the, the big thing that we face as manufacturers is, is supply and demand. And on the basis that in Europe at the moment, they're going through an emission program called WLTP, where they have to lower to various different targets. And the only way we can as manufacturers reach those targets is a lot of electrification. So the demand for electric vehicles in Europe is very high. We can only build X amount. That, that's the problem. So our allocation will always go, be favorable there, because as a manufacturer, we have to meet those emissions targets, is one thing, because the fines and the penalties are astronomical. And so everyone in all manufacturers, even in, I would say, in the premium and the luxury car segment, are treating the Europe market. But the other problem that we face is if we could, if we could bring 5,000 electric vehicles here to sell next year, the question is, could we sell them? And if I honestly have to say at this moment in time, today, we couldn't. Mm. So, so we're faced a twofold thing. If we can start to generate demand and people buy in and we can drive it forward, we will be able to get the supply. That's the one thing we face is get, getting the supply. So it's, we really do need the awareness to be raised um, with, with a number of things. And as Sam said, we will end up with more charging stations than cars. And in some ways, that's quite sad in the fact is that we should probably have, uh, a th it should be a 30% ratio at this moment in time. And we're not, we're not there. Mm. And that's where we need to be. So we, I think we're all very passionate about this and we're all working and pushing really hard. As Stefan says, FMC Club do lots and lots of events, lots of things we try and push to get electrification. But we probably also need is, is, is government and other investors to obviously understand and raise the awareness. I know that the, the government was 20% was you needed to be green vehicles, but that's hybrid as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, hybrid is not pure EV, it's, it's reducing mm -hmm. carbon emissions, but not totally. So we really do need a, a, a big push in that area. 
we can talk about incentives. We can talk about so many different things. But even if we did have incentives, the question has to be, would people still buy? So we started with incentives with, obviously, the, the SALIC was uh, no registration, the various different things that the, the charging was free. Uh, a lot of people say we need to do more on incentives, which if we look at the Europe model, or a lot in some of the main countries, there is a sub subsistence to the buyer, obviously, for, f to buy the vehicle. Because the vehicles are quite highly priced. We have to acknowledge that because of the cost of the battery. But as the technology improves, the cost is coming down. But then when you look at Europe, you rent the battery. So there's so many different things to explore and possibly put into place which will make it more attractive. But to be attractive, we have to convince the consumer that electric vehicle is the right thing to drive. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's the one thing. Once you're convinced, you'll buy into it. And I think our generation are the ones that, are, that, that need convincing. Where we need to convince, and I've always been very strong on this point, is it's the future, the new generation, the 15, 16 year olds that are gonna leave school and start to drive. We need them to push this through because they're the ones that are very technology related. They're the ones that will believe in electric car and won't think anything, anything more of it because they won't have lived the, the internal combustion engine. Um, so from that point, we really do need to look at the youth to push this through. And as you say, by 40,000 vehicles is a lot of vehicles in a, sh in a considerable short space of time, to be fair. Sam, do you want to add something? Yeah. And then Steve. Yeah, thanks. I have to say that I'm extremely disappointed by the European manufacturers of cars. Extremely disappointed. Because if you look next, uh, and this is not, nothing personal, yeah? Because if you look at uh, what's going to happen next year, we're going to have more than 1,000 Model 3 Teslas coming to the UAE, which is basically doubling the number of all electric vehicles that's happening now. So also Tesla is, uh, you know, not dependent on any kind of subsidies, is not dependent. It's, uh, if you look at the price quality ratio of the, of the Model 3, if you look at the price quality ratio, it is reasonable for the people here to consider buying it. And I certainly believe after, you know, having worked with many stakeholders over the last couple of years, that this industry needs a visionary like Elon Musk to succeed, yeah? So you can't do everything 100% perfect in this industry because you need the speed. So what Elon Musk has done, he has taken a car, he has, you know, ripped it out everything which is inside, went to a Chinese computer store, took a monitor, screwed it inside the car and said, well, this car you can have for a price that, you know, satisfied the demand. And the people are happy with that. It's basically the 80-20 rule, yeah? You can achieve 80% of a certain result by investing 20% of the efforts. And everything I've seen so far, European manufacturers, they still in the old thinking of wanting to do everything 100% perfect. And once they're ready with their cars, the market has already gone, technology has advanced. And this is something a visionary like Elon Musk is always a step ahead. And the only one we saw so far matching this kind of visions is the, uh, the, the former CEO of Renault, uh, Carlos Gossen, who has been the leader of electric vehicle driving in, uh, in Europe, who is unfortunately no longer in control. So we as infrastructure provider are now sitting, not able to do much, waiting for hopefully the European manufacturers to give us a couple of cars in the next couple of years so we can consider ourselves and our region having a sort of a market hmm. at the moment. Steve, you wanted to add something? Well, I want to say, let's not oversell you how well Europe's done. There is one country in Europe that has really done well so much better than everybody else, it's hardly even fair to talk about. But they only have six million people. Netherlands, but, you're talking no, about. No, no, yeah. uh, Norway. Norway. Oh, Norway. Norway. So Norway has achieved 50% in sales. Mm -hmm. In actually Oslo itself, uh, I've heard it's 75 to 80% of vehicles are electric. 
That is spectacular. Any Norwegians here? Thank you. No, didn't think so. But no other country in Europe has hit 10% tar uh, market share. Mm. Uh, you're right, Denmark, the, tree, the Scandinavian tree huggers are ahead, but uh, these are also the ones that tax cars at 100%. And so they've re they have significantly incented the sales of electric vehicles. The consumer, nowhere in the world has the consumer said, uh, with, uh, except for Tesla, uh, exactly, because they took a whole nother look at it, but nowhere in the world has the consumer said, without significant economic incentives, I will go buy one of these. And if we compare it to renewable energy, the government's understood that at, at 10 years ago, solar and wind was not an economically viable option at all. It now is the cheapest energy on earth, but it wasn't 10 years ago. And that we need the governments in, in this region, like Norway, like Denmark, uh, at, like the Netherlands, to say, okay, we're gonna put a stake in the ground and we're gonna make some uneconomic decisions that are good for the environment. And that is the only way country, we, we really, in, really gotten electric vehicles to be sold anywhere in the world, right? So, to do so, is probably, you need to put in a taxation on large engine vehicles. You take that taxation and you give it back as a subsidy for electric vehicles. It's a bonus malus system. Uh, and that's the, the only way you can only way it. it's worked. Yeah. It's the only place the only places that it's worked have done exactly what you're it talking does. about. It works well. So we've talked about economic incentives, we've talked about the role of government. So Stefan, maybe what about the role of new technologies, new business models? What do you think is going to take to take us to the next level? Well, uh, again, big questions <laughs> that uh, that we are raising here. Um, yeah, taxations uh, in, the re in the oil uh, region is, uh, is, is difficult. Uh, so just to answer Stephen, uh, but you, we know that at the world scale level, probably the last one standing in terms of cost of oil will be uh, this part of the world. And, uh, and I think that even if we reach a bit like the report you were mentioning, if we are in the 10 to 20 uh, US dollars a barrel, uh, there will be a there will be a shift to, towards uh, electric mobility and also towards renewable energy. Uh, this is a bet that we have taken uh, at NG. We are into decarbonization. Uh, we believe a lot in uh, electric mobility. We started with our own fleet. So, but uh, as we we talked about, I think we have to start with the the 20 percent that is uh, highly polluting. So if you talk about uh, policies, uh, we still see here and there uh, those uh, big buses, you know, with that uh, black smoke uh, on, the, on the highway. Uh, th these buses have uh, been amortized uh, for 30 years and they're still on the road. Uh, the same with the construction uh, trucks. Um, so we have to work on this, uh, the, the public transport. Um, so these are new business models, electric buses that we we at NG, we have, uh, we have invested in those in, uh, in Latin America where the, the models are viable. Uh, we hope it would come here, uh, but we could imagine that in the near future, um, greenification of your own fleet, uh, whether you are public with your buses or a construction company with your staff transport, this is what we have done. We are doing this in, in some of our European countries, but also Latin America. Uh, and if we can also club this with renewable energy and then close the loop and we can see that over 25 years time with the length of the, the life length of those batteries, very little uh, moving parts in those vehicles, you can keep them for 10 years. Uh, again, Elon Musk, our best friend, uh, has, uh, is almost guaranteeing lifetime for his new car, right. so unlimited mileage, <coughs> that's how uh, strong, he believes that this uh, vehicle can last in time. So once you add all these uh, changes in technologies and uh, renewable energies, but also less use of uh, that huge, uh, you know, that uh, fossil fuel is available today. So it's very tempting, of course, to, to mm -hmm. continue tap into this. But for this region, it would be, it's already the case. Moving towards renewable energy makes more sense for this kind of region, for the oil-based countries, so they can retail the oil to other countries that are more in need and that are willing to pay for it. So 
if they start to cut subsidies more and more on fuel, on diesel, gasoline, as we have seen. Uh, some we have been here quite long enough to see uh, one tank has doubled over the, the last uh, 10 years. So economically, uh, disregard the fact and the price of uh, the price tag of the electric vehicle. It will, uh, it will become, uh, uh, it will become uh, the, the, the norm. And we can so add on this what we see, shared mobility. We tr truly believe that the future of mobility is also uh, through uh, shared. Uh, we were talking new generation. In my office, I have a lot of new uh, young people, uh, newcomers from uh, across the world. Most of them don't have a driving license. Uh, they're using uh, transport. And in the city, we, we are well equipped to move towards this. So I think uh, we have a lot of topics around this, uh, these big questions, but uh, we, we truly believe uh, in that. So it's a great discussion. Unfortunately, we, we are running short on time. We had one Slido question, which I'll address very quickly, which is if EVs are charged by coal or gas-based plants, then how will it fall under the green and clean category? I think if it's a coal plant, it is going to be dirty, yes. But the, the thing is, if we're going towards a renewable future, we will have a completely renewable system with electric vehicles utilizing renewable energy. So I think that's my answer. Um, do we have time for any more question? Uh, no, we do not. Okay. Unfortunately, we... we <laughs> one, one. One question. <laughs> All right. Quick question, please, if you can keep it very brief. It's to the panel. Um, I don't know much about EVs, but I've seen the Diva charging station, so my question is very simple. Uh, there's AC there, there's DC there, and then there are different types. Where do you think the industry will move? Is it pure AC, DC, certain condition, and why? The why is also important for, for our region, for example. Who can answer Anyone? this very briefly? Yeah, I mean, this is going to remain as it is at the moment between AC and DC, because not everyone can, uh, can provide um, 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 you know, so much energy that's needed to charge your car within uh, 10 minutes. So the amount of uh, energy that's in the towers on your private homes is very limited. Most of the case for fast chargers, you need to have government entities or large networks in order to guarantee this kind of fast charging. So you will always have a mix of both. There is no, no line where you can say this is going to dominate in future. Okay. We, yeah. If I can just add, uh, you've seen the ecosystem is being built around around uh, electric mobility, so I really invite you to to engage with us. Uh, most of us are part of the Future Mobility Club to discuss those big questions, improve uh, as uh, citizens or expatriates of this uh, this beautiful country to improve uh, happiness and uh, and uh, environment uh, concerns. So please engage with us uh, for following meetings and uh, presentations. Okay, so I want to thank my... I hope the moderator can indulge. You don't yes. turn a woman when she asks a question. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, yes, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of initiatives to promote uh, the electric cars in the market. Can somebody shed light on what happens to the batteries? What is the life cycle of a battery and what happens when it finishes? What is the mechanism that has been put in place to deal with batteries? It's reusable. So the battery has a second life. So when we take a battery, as a manufacturer, uh, we are responsible for the battery. So we reuse the lithium ion with different partners for other different forms of energy. Um, and you will see there's various different programs where we can build battery packs from to supply energy, battery stations. But the batteries are reused, or the lithium ion is reusable, so it has a second life, which all the OEMs take full responsibility for to ensure that we get the maximum use of the lithium ion in a second life once it becomes the chemistry has, has run down for the battery of the vehicle. Okay, so with that, folks, let's give uh, the panelists a round of applause. Uh, if you have questions, you can meet with any of us after the panel. But thank you all for listening, and uh, we have the next.